And tonight I'm delighted to be interviewing Christina Mercer and Helen Lewis to discuss the historical record and those who have been left out of it broadly. Um, the conversation falls in the second half of Entre Nous, which is a year long interdisciplinary series featuring scholars, journalists and artists from around the world. And Entre Nous is supported and was created by the American Library in Paris, Columbia Global Centers Paris and Columbia's Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Um, so I'm going to launch right in. These conversations tend to go very quickly. Christy, I want to start with you. You are the Gustav M. Byrne uh, Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. You're the co-editor of Oxford New Histories of Philosophy. In 2017, you initiated the Center for New Narratives in Philosophy. In 2018, you created Just Ideas, which is an educational program in Brooklyn's Metropolitan Detention Center. Um, I want to talk first about an address that you gave to the American Philosophical Association in January of 2020, in which due to, I'm quoting you, moral and practical reasons, you called for a change, arguing that it was and indeed is time for professional philosophers to confront the racism and misogyny that taint our discipline and our culture. In the address, you argue that the standard history of philosophy warrants a radical revision, you reveal the odd historical contingencies of the standard history story's origins, and you offer examples of how we can use the past to benefit the present. Uh, thinking about those first two points, can you tell us, um, as we get started here, in more detail about this, this kind of standard history of philosophy and why it's time to radically revise it for the 21st century? Now, thank you for that question. And obviously, I have a lot to say. I will be very brief about about the first part of your, or, or the main part of your question, namely where the history of philosophy as we kind of know and maybe hate it come, came from. Um, the short version of the story came from the German idealist, um, neo-Kantians in the 19th century, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and eventually Ernst Kassirer, um, have a, you know, um, this lecture I gave have, has this lovely quotation that's a, that's a um, parody of the big story, which is, you know, it came to pass that God created philosophy and the Renaissance, you know, was like the rib from Adam is the metaphor and it goes on from there. And so if you, you know, so if you took history of philosophy and especially in England and the States, but also really um, wherever you are in Europe, the, the canon changes ever so slightly. There's if you're studying history philosophy in France, there's more French philosophers. If you're studying history philosophy in German, Germany, there's more German philosophers. But the point is somehow that philosophy began anew with the great Descartes. And then there's this great, this series of great men who um, all were kind of standing on their mountain, you know, commu each communicating from one mountain to the next. And it's a really uh, kind of grand, wonderful story. And it leads to us is the way it goes. But in fact, it was, as I say, created in the 19th century for all kinds of complicated reasons I could go into. And it um, stripped the history of philosophy of hugely important and influential people. Um, um, I'm very interested in women in that part of the story, but Islamic thinkers, Jewish thinkers were all very much part of a conversation that um, let's say, let's think of Spinoza, for example, Spinoza was himself very interested in the history of the Kabbalah, his, his ethics is very much motivated by that. But also just another aside, something that I didn't talk about in that uh, my presidential address is the fact that we're also having to reinvent the history of political philosophy. And I didn't talk about this because I don't work on it exactly. But one of the book series you mentioned, um, I oversee two book series, but both of which are in, an attempt to kind of um, rethink and reimagine the history of philosophy. One series is called Oxford Philosophical Concept, and you take a concept and track it through the history of philosophy, often thinking about um, a very important figures who are left out of the story. So we have, for example, one, a book on health and what, you know, how to, how to think about health. And that's extremely interesting, by the way. And I love the fact that the longest book in this series is the one on evil, by the way. It has a bright red cover. And we were thinking about convincing um, Oxford to let us have little horns coming out of the book, but they, they refused to do that. 
But the other series is actually much more radical. It's called Oxford New Histories of Philosophy. My co-editor is Martin, um, I'm sorry, is Melvin Rogers. His expertise is in Africana philosophy. And as it turns out, there are um, fr um, freed Americans, formerly enslaved Americans, black Americans, both men and women, writing about liberty and freedom, as you could imagine people might have in the, seven, in the um, 19th century. And it turns out there's a whole part of the, of the history of political philosophy that we just don't know anything about. And so major, fil uh, major figures who do the history of liberalism, for example, um, are having to rewrite um, that story, partly because of authors were discovering and people were having to, um, were, were asking to do primary textbooks and also, um, and also monographs. So what's very exciting to me is that if you, put, if you just for a moment put aside the standard story that we're all told and actually dare ask questions about, well, who else was contributing and what is the, as it were, the real story, such as we can never get at the real story. There's all of this diversity to be discovered and for me, what's especially exciting is the history of philosophy just looks very, very different than it did. And so there's a lot of really, really good and exciting work to be done. Thank you so much. And I think you just set up uh, bringing in Helen Lewis into the conversation so well as you talk about kind of men standing alone on mountains, you know, capital G, capital M, great men, and this idea of uh, peeling, peeling that back and finding out the real story. Um, Helen, you're similarly interested in radical revision. You're a staff writer for The Atlantic, though your work has also appeared in The Guardian, The Sunday Times, The New York Times, among others. You're the author of this great book, uh, Difficult Women, A History of Feminism in 11 Fights, which was published by uh, Penguin Random House in 2020. And you're also the host and creator of the BBC Radio 4 show, Great Wives. Um, and this is where I want to begin, because I think it, um, it uh, highlights everything that... Christia was just saying. Um, so I want to think about the podcast and this project of revising male dominated narratives. And in the first episode, Ghosts, you set up the stakes of the show, noting that there's a dumb phrase behind every great man is a great woman. It's supposed to make women feel better about not getting enough credit for their work. But what if you ask, we switch the focus and look straight at the women behind those men. How about looking at some great lives, which is another kind of, um, podcast or radio show in, in the UK and asking were they made possible by great wives. So tell us more about this phrase behind every great man is a great woman and why in your opinion is it time to tell the stories uh, of these women as ends in themselves to borrow <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think what, what Chris is saying is really interesting because it sort of speaks to what I've been doing too, which is all actually to look at if you're going to be a philosopher, a great philosopher, what are the conditions in your life that you need for that to happen? And it's so interesting to think about, um, I mean, not quite in the philosophy space, but someone like Isaac Newton. Actually, he had this incredible life where he spent, you know, he did, he did his research on gravity and then he moved on to biblical chronology and alchemy rather less successfully. But he lived, you know, the entire time in a, in a college, in an Oxbridge College, Cambridge College, um, you know, where someone brought him his breakfast and did his laundry. And that is, you know, and, and then you look at the lives, if you read about the lives of someone like Charles Darwin or Tolstoy, for example, you're looking at the fact that they are getting to do the, this great work because of the fact that someone else is doing all the scut work, you know, all the kind of, um, you know, child rearing and stuff like that. And I think it's really important to bring that dimension back in to talk about those things. And, you know, those, those are privileges of sex and race and class and, 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 and various other things. Um, and that's interesting to try and round out the picture like that. And the other side of it, again, which I think speaks to Christie's work, is to look at all the, um, I have this phrase that I'm going to use in my new book, which is on genius, about the kind of the lost Einsteins, you know, all the people who didn't happen, you know, who didn't make it and the reasons that that, that happened. And that can be, you know, that can very often be for reasons of sex. You know, for example, I've just been writing about Hertha Ayrton, a brilliant electrical engineer of the late uh, 1800s, was not admitted to the Royal Society. She won a medal from the Royal Society, but women, married women were simply not admitted to it. You know, the fact that women, if you look at the great female painters from history, of whom there are very few, most of them had fathers who were painted. You know, um, Artemisa Gentileschi, her father Orazio was a painter. Um, uh, Elizabeth Vigi Lebrun, her father was a painter. So they got access to both the training that they needed and also physically the the tools that they needed. And I think this is one of the things that's really interesting now when we live in a culture of so much more abundance is 
as a painter in the 15th and 16th centuries, whether or not you could get hold of pigments was a really big deal. They were expensive. And all of these things about the fact that what allows human flourishing, what are the conditions for human flourishing, is I think the thing that has been the, the kind of thread that runs through my work over the last couple of years. And, and you know, who gets the spotlight? Who is, who is the person who's anointed by their university as the spokesman, usually, for the university? You know, who, who is called a public intellectual? And what are the criteria for that? I think all that stuff is really interesting to interrogate. So um, just just to follow up quickly before going back uh, to Christy, up, are you also, you're also thinking about the kind of materiality of of lives, not just wives. And I wanted to quote you on this because um, uh, I, I will will spend um, more time thinking about a specific example of this. But you note that the whole idea of solitary genius very often doesn't hold up to much scrutiny. Look at the life story of any great man and you'll find mentors, collaborators, patrons and inspirations. You might also find people to your point of Oxford and institutions who made one mostly his life easier, um, whether it was the secretary, uh, the housekeeper who cooked his dinner. And this is, this is the quote that I particularly love, or the wife who did all those things, like the best combination of domestic servant, accountant, friend, lover, cook, emotional support peacock, substitute mother, and personal assistant you could possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to talk about wives specifically, because what a wife did was a very specific mm. role. And there have been some great husbands through history, but it's much rarer that somebody will subjugate their entire life to making their other half shine when that's a, um, a, in for amending, amending that for a woman. Mm. But yeah, the, the thing about a wife is that a wife knows you as intimately as anyone possibly can, thus making them a much better PA. Um, <laughs> like, and that's just a really crude way of, of saying it. The idea of the perfect secretary is somebody who absolutely anticipates everything you need before you need it. Um, so there is a particular role and function for a wife. And it's really interesting when you look through history, how many um, you know, men we should maybe talk about more in a collaborative sense. So the Blakes, for example, with their printmaking um, were, were collaborative. Not a wife, but William and Dorothy Wordsworth were two people who absolutely fed off each other. And, and it's very hard to see how they function independently. The Curies being a very um, obvious example of two people who were interesting apart, but together were phenomenal. Uh, and that doesn't always have to be a, a marriage. You know, there are lots of always lots of examples of well of creative pairs who are much greater than the sun of some of their parts so you know all the way through history people have been kind of prodding and deconstructing the idea of the lone genius or the great man theory of history um but it's what's interesting to me is it's so incredibly resilient it keeps coming back and i think about the fact that when you have you know if you think about the modern biopic the way that it works is basically presenting it as one person's story and and it try, trying to tell everything through the idea of one person's trajectory. And that is a mode of storytelling of, of history making that will always end up kind of coming back essentially to great man theory. Mm. So let's go to you, Christia, because this is um, uh, a topic that you've done a lot of research on and well, particularly in the mid 17th uh, and 18th century. Um, so in this time, you've rejected what you describe as the dramatic, but uh, you know, the kind of dramatic with the Hans Zimmer um, music to Helen's point, but false story of René Descartes um, as the near single-handed, and these are your words, near single-handed creator of modern philosophy and the near single-handed creator of the modern self um, to destabilize this uh, dramatic but false story. Tell us about um, Julian of Norwich, Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avilia. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can't tell you about all of those people, <laughs> but um, well, tell us yeah, about right. No, no, but it, I, it would be really fun to do so. So one thing that I'm really very interested in is the, um, the specific kinds of challenges that women and people who were kind of lower down the hierarchy, I call kind of epistemological hierarchy, and, and, and unlike what Helen is working on, and you know, it sounds like very, very interesting, but many of the women that Julian of Norwich um, was herself an anchoress, you know, basically a religious person. Um, Teresa of Avila was a religious person. And one of the things that a lot of really fascinating young, youngish scholars are discovering is that all kinds of like, so the question is like, how do you have authority if everyone tells you that women, anyone who, any woman who wants to speak out, similarly in 19th century 
um, uh, American culture for black people. But if you dare speak out, you are a deviant, right? There's something kind of wrong with you. So I'm very, fa I'm fascinated by the way in which people navigated that. If you actually spoke your mind too aggressively, as did a French um, a woman, a Marguerite Parit, um, she refused to back down and actually was was burned at the stake and, you know, literally set a fire. So for people like Teresa, for, for people like um, um, Julian of Norwich, people had to navigate having a voice and actually being incredibly brilliant and speaking, you know, um, having insights, not just philosophical, but theological, but also doing so in a way that was kind of kind and gentle and interesting and so on. And so one of the things that, that interests me too is that there is a, there's sort of genres of philosophy, the meditative genre, for joy in the kind of commentary on God, for example. Um, another really important figure that's not been recognized as a philosopher is Hildegard von Bingham. People have begun to recognize her as a wonderful composer and a you know, great leader in the 12th century but her philosophical work has not been properly anal analyzed in my opinion. And what, why have these women been, as it were, left out of the story? It's partly because the story got told without them, but it's also because they had to write in genres and in modes that, that were not too deviant, you know, that didn't call attention to their authority in a way. So one, one thing that a few of us are doing, and I feel very you know, committed to, is sort of rereading and rethinking these, these women um, in their contribution. So I'll just tell you about um, my discovery of Teresa. It's really kind of, a, in a way, kind of a funny story. I spent years working on Leibniz and I was in the Leibniz archives and so on. And Leibniz mentions Teresa of Avila, who's a Spanish nun who was very, you know, kind of famous in her day. And I read her, this is way back in you know, 20 years ago almost. It's like, oh, I don't see any philosophy there. But then I kind of became a little bit more interested in reconsidering it. And I was actually flying with my sons to visit their godfathers um, in Wisconsin and thought, you know, I'll take a little look before my little vacation here at Teresa again. And like in over Ohio or someplace like that in my plane in the plane, I thought. I won't maybe say um, the curse words I said to myself, but this is like profoundly interesting philosophy, A, and B, she is setting up Descartes. So in a paper I published, which has become kind of a thing now, I, I show that the major arguments in Descartes' meditations are in Teresa. So we kind of have tended to think that Descartes' meditation began early modern philosophy, you know, started philosophy anew. And first of all, no, none of uh, um, Descartes' contemporaries thought it was that exciting and new, by the way. Everyone knew that he was writing a meditation in part of this tr tradition. And he borrows um, arguments from Teresa. So Teresa has the evil demon argument. He, she has a version of what's called the cogito argument, the think I exist argument. So, you know, the big joke is that, you know, Descartes is not our father, <laughs> as it turns out. And much of this is um, in Teresa. And I think, um, um, Alice, you and I had agreed that you might show a slide because as we said, yes. you know, a picture is worth a, a million words. So let me, we'll, we'll show a slide of, of Teresa if you, if you can let do me. that. I know I need to, okay, hold on. I just need to. Yeah. So let me just set this up. So uh, one of the ways um, I think about Teresa in the 17th century is she was like the Beyonce of the 17th century. Everybody knew her. Everyone thought she was awesome. So you might kind of hate her though. I don't know how you could do that. But like Beyonce, everyone knew who she was and she was kind of out there and she was awesome. So all of Descartes' friends knew all about her. She was the favorite of the Jesuits. By the way, the Jesuits. Who yeah, you should share your screen. It's not working for me if you have it. Okay. Um, okay. This. So I have access to it. Yeah, you should. Okay. Let me just see while I'm talking if I can do this. Um, okay. All participants. Yeah, you know what? We might wait. Why don't we? Why don't I set okay. this up while um, okay. while Helen's talking again? But I just want to like one of the things that's really striking about Teresa is that everybody knew about her, and we had thought of her as the you know a great thinker. Mm. She's actually not that long ago became a doctoressa of the church. 
So she's even recognized by the Catholic Church as being a profound thinker, mm -hmm. but no one, no historian of philosophy, including me in my early career, mm -hmm. thought of her as worth, someone worth studying. Mm -hmm. So That's so uh, interesting to me because um, there's a book by Joanna Russ uh, called How to Suppress Women's Writing, which has this great cover in its original printing, which is like, you know, she wrote it, but oh, she got help or she didn't really write it or, you know, she wrote it, but it wasn't that important or she wrote it, but she only wrote one of it or, you know, she right. was a one-off. And there's been a big project in feminist historiography for the last 50 years of rediscovering those people who are influences on the people that you've heard of. Um, you know, a very classic example being Jane Austen. Well, I think still the way that I was raised was the idea that Jane Austen sort of arose like out of the sea, like, you know, um, you know, like, very young, <laughs> and, like, like the Lady of the Lake, like there and, and no one, you know, no one before her and, and all women before that had sort of not written, you know, didn't women didn't write under their own names, you know, because mm -hmm. people had vaguely heard of George Eliot, but not right. true at all as, you know. There's this great throwaway sentence in, in What's the Rise of the Novel that says, you know, the, of course, the majority of novels in the 18th century were written by women. And you mm. go, what? Hang on a minute. And it was the case that those were the popular novels. But the fact that they were popular is obviously what damned them. They weren't real literature, not like, you know, um, Samuel Richardson's work, for example. Yes. And so you can discover all of these people who are obviously black people like Belinda Edgeworth, who are writing in very much modes that Austin went on to use the same kind of tone, but that somehow, and I think this is a bit what you're talking about, Christia, that they've sort of been like, like sand eroded away from the, the, the face of the sculpture to which is to the one person that we've decided to remember. Just right. Helen, I, wa I, wanna, I wanna get you on this question of genre because you actually make this point yourself in the book that you were worried about including um, too much personal, uh, anecdotal evidence because you jokingly but quite seriously we're realizing it now in the conversation you didn't want the book to be moved to a self-help section of the bookstore yeah for the kind of like you go girl like five ways to be super difficult um mm -hmm. but I wanted it to be a serious work of history because that's you know what I feel that it is but but what Christy says about those early female philosophers writing in sort of approved genres is something that I think you've seen throughout history with female writers. You know, the conduct books of the 18th century are a really good example of that. Um, and, and there has been the sense that, and I think it still happens that you get that, that women are pushed toward, or, or when women write about certain subjects, they're regarded in a feminized way. Um, and so, yeah, I did have a big conversation with myself about putting too much memoir in there because I think it's sort of seen that still that men's experiences are about universal human experience. Whereas if you write about those things as a woman, that you're writing about women's writing, and, and why would any why would men be interested in that? That's a sort of narrow niche interest. We're gonna, Christy, we're gonna go back to you. I just want to, Helen, get you before we time totally escapes us. Um, you alluded to many great wives in your podcast. Can you just um, just tell us a kind of anecdotal story or just a, a brief story of one of them that you think makes the point the best? Well, Angela in the chat mentioned um, Mileva Marek, who was yeah. uh, Einstein's first wife, who I cover. And I think her story is really interesting. I don't, I don't think we can make the case. And some people have overclaimed that she basically wrote the relativity papers or that she was as brilliant as Einstein. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but she was, a st a, she was better than, it, than he was at maths when they were both students and they were students together. Um, and he was a terrible student. This is the thing that's interesting. He was like a fine at school and, and actually got a, a fail mark essentially in one of his university exams. And that's the reason why he didn't go into a teaching post. He went to work in the famously in the patent office in Zurich where he wrote these kind of three papers that changed the world and, and published them all in his Annus Mirabilis 1904. Um, but Mileva had this, you know, she was the smartest girl in her school. She was this, you know, she, to get to university to study physics at that time, that was an extraordinary achievement. But when she failed her exams, that was it. There was no retaking for her. You know, she was, you know, she that was, you know, there was no, there was no kind of little bit, the little bits of leeway that sort of smooth some people's path out. And then when she, um, she was with Einstein, she got pregnant and she was sent back to Serbia where she had a daughter, Lisa who seems to have died, this is an astonishing story to me, seems to have died, possibly a scarlet fever, but, but we don't really know. There's one reference in the papers, but it was essentially covered up, this baby from the first marriage, by the kind of what people call now the Einstein priests, the kind of keepers of his memory. And again, it's that process of tidying up the story um, mm -hmm. that she, you know, she, she and he would talk together about, physics and he would air all his you know his theories with it. he had a great 
he was one of the rare men who at the time who was married to somebody who understood the physical concepts that he was talking about. That was a huge advantage to somebody who was developing what were at the time incredibly iconoclastic theories. But you know what, she was a bit demanding and naggy and his second wife, who was called Elsa Einstein, like that was her surname before they got married, um, was much more the template of the kind of sweet, docile, academic wife who was happy to go along and sort of, you know, never threaten him and sort of darn his socks happily and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, when he moves to America, neither Mileva nor their two surviving children go with him. Uh, one of whom is committed to mental institutions for most of his life. And again, just sort of slightly lowered in the mix of the story. And so we have this story about somebody who in the early 1900s was, you know, coming up with these incredible ideas all on his own, which not just writes Maleva out of the story, but also writes out the kind of academic community and his friendship group, who were all really important to developing his ideas. And so one of the things I wanted to do was put her and them back into that story. Thank you. So, Christia, let's go back to you, and you're going to show, uh, if you can, the image. Oh, I, I think we uh, since we're past Teresa, okay. I think we can okay. give up on that. Yeah, okay. I would. I would like to respond to. I mean, one of the things that I think is really important about some of the points that Alice has made is the extent. I guess a couple of things. One is that. It's true that women, the genre that women engaged with, the, the genres they engaged with were ones that were kind of like demeaned later. But it's also true that lots of men engaged in them too. Like, you know, um, let's say Montaigne's essays, mm -hmm. you know, he kind of, he, he actually created that genre and it became quite the thing. And it's fascinating that it, then he has sometimes written out of the history of philosophy or not considered as important because analytic 20th century analytic philosophers kind of like don't like that kind of um, what more personal um, reflection. So that's somewhat interesting. But also I think that that like in, like in Teresa's day or the day, you know, there's um, there's these medieval like Hildegard from Bingham, they were really important. But when people started telling the history of philosophy later, and this is what this is what happened to um, um, Teresa Shirley, but also some, to some other philosophers, uh, philosophers later philosophers just simply um, um, wrote them out. So one striking example of that, this is not somebody I work on, but as uh, uh, one of my colleagues does in, in our book series, is Amelie de Chatelet was one of the prominent um, intellectuals in the 18th century, understood Newton, speaking of Newton, translated Newton's text and was famous or is now famous only because she translated Newton and was married or was had a relationship with Voltaire. In fact, she had an intellectual center in southern France. People all over France came to learn mathematics and physics from her. In the, um, in the 18th, century encyclop 18th century encyclopedias of D'Alembert and so on, she was quoted at length. She was so famous, her name isn't even attached to the accounts of space and time and, you know, and body. And then by the end of the 19th century, so you know, slowly she stops being talked about so much. She's kind of like made invisible, as one of my friends puts it. And by the late 19th century, people like Ernst Cassier, early 20th century, they knew about her, but just preferred not to include her mm -hmm. in their stories. And so it's not it. So there are actually people who just systematically ripped out of the history of philosophy, women, even women who are on their own, who are not wives, you know, women who were very prominent thinkers in their day and taken very seriously, got slowly disappeared, as the verb goes, um, in telling the history of science or the history of philosophy. Okay, so let's go a little bit off piece here. Helen, you're, you're working on genius and the history of genius. How are you empirically, as a very serious <laughs> historian and journalist, um, coming up, pushing up against these absences um, on the record, how do you fill them in without making things up? Yeah, it's. I think that's the thing is that you have to be very clear about the fact you're um, conducting a historical project, not an activist project. And those two things don't sometimes um, align. And one of the things I wrote against in Difficult Women is the sort of odd, you know, the reclaiming of women to this narrative of, of like lost heroines through history which I just do not like because you don't have to be a heroine to deserve your place in history, right? Well, when we're talking about people who might have had views that we might now consider quite repellent on subjects, but that doesn't mean they weren't important thinkers. And so reclaiming them in this very 
upbeat, you know, heroin narrative is, is the wrong way to approach it, I think, if you're trying to do a serious history. Um, but, you, you know, it's, it, it's absolutely a question that you run up against. Like the, the work I've been doing at the moment is about the, you know, the history of the birth of genius studies as a kind of discipline, which is really interesting to me because it's, it overlaps so broadly with the history of intelligence studies. And that is riven both with sexism, but very particularly with racism. Um, and the idea about classifying different races, and it's absolutely inextricable from that. And so it becomes more and more obvious about the fact that you end up with a self-fulfilling prophecy where only white men can be geniuses, and look, here's our science that we have to support the fact. And if we look back through history, only white men have been geniuses. And that means tidying away Emily de Chatelet and anyone else you might get out of it, because no, 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 it's natural. Like that, those, those people were minor. We all know science has proved that white men are best, and look, we've got the historical evidence, and then the two keep circling each other forever. Um, and that's, you know, that that is a really big strand of what I think has, has ruined that as an academic discipline is kind of just so stories. That's what my friend Adam Rutherford calls them when he talks about evolutionary psychology, right? Which is, you know, men see red better because they used to collect berries. Those kind of stories that are just made up to kind of justify a sort of status quo. The history of genius is full of stories like that where it's like, here's a couple of examples. Let's pretend we've got some science to back this up. Um, and let's study what the record that we currently have and pretend that history has carried out some kind of objective accounting of who is most important or most brilliant and not bringing those biases in. And I think that's the bit where I think my work overlaps with Christie is in the sense that we are part of this grander project of taking a look back at the canon and what has survived and saying, this wasn't an objective process. Actually, if we look at it, we can find a lot out about the people who did it and a lot out about ourselves. And some of those findings are really interesting. So can, I, can I add one, just one thing about that? Because I think what's, what Alice said is really important. And one of the things, you know, again, we can approach this from all kinds of direct, different directions and ask different kinds of questions, but it's exactly putting aside the just so stories. And in a way, doing the hard work of that's what this book series is an attempting to do is find truly great scholars to do um, translations or editions of these texts that have simply been left out or not taken seriously enough mm -hmm. and, and making them available so that people can speak for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you do kind of don't like what they say <laughs> or, you know, and there's some, there are sometimes kind of problematic asides, but then you can actually use them as you want to retell the history of philosophy. So it's not just like filling in the gaps because it makes us feel better, right? Yeah. It's filling in the gaps because the gaps are um, deserving of being filled in. But also, Christian, I want to go to your um, paper, the, ph the Philosophical Roots of Western Misogyny, because this is a great example of by using the, the great men of, mm -hmm. of ancient philosophy, so Plato and Aristotle, and then the medical theorists Hippocrates and Galen, you use their work to uh, kind of highlight um, the, as you say, the, the, the roots of Western misogyny, um, justifying the view that female bodies are imperfect or mutilated compared to male bodies from which it is supposed to follow that women are morally inferior to men. You write, our ancient authors chose not to celebrate women's creative powers, but to read women's reproductive capacities as inferior to the strengths of men and to ignore entirely the development of their cognitive capacities. Instead of celebrating their own powers, women were taught to succumb to their natural weaknesses for the sake of their health um, and of their communities. Can you talk about why it is actually important to attend to um, the great men because in their work are the seeds of millennia of misogyny and sexism, right? Yeah, there's really two points. I mean, one of the things are, are two kind of parts of the movement that's, happen that, that's happening now. I mean, a lot of important work has been done. Um, for example, on Kant's, Kant is a great, you know, one of the great philosophers. You know, it would be terrible to take Kant out of the history of philosophy. Surely no one would argue for that. But Kant wrote text explaining um, the um, a kind of human hierarchy. I mean, so Africans are supposed to be less capable of reason than other human beings. And there's, there really is a whole hierarchy there. Um, you know, uh, there's plenty, I mean, in fact, Newton had some really weird views about, about things. So there's plenty of people in history, 
plenty of our you know, great heroes in history philosophy that have very unpleasant views. And I think it's important to, to, to resurrect those, to kind of un understand those and actually ask a question like, how, what would it be like? How can a great man have really, really unpleasant, you know, how can a great thinker, a great philosopher, so a great man in the sense that a gr really truly um, great thinker have some very, very unpleasant ideas. And so, so people are doing that and interrogating that. And I think that's important for our classes. You know, I think people, students need to know that um, uh, it's not that, 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 that our even great philosophical folks are not themselves um, always um, noble and, and insightful. But what really interested me is that I'm, I'm very, I, I think it's very important to offer genealogies. And so like my story often in my, a lot of my classes, how did it come to pass that people were devoted to a belief, you know, a P and a Q belief? And, and if you can tell the story about how it came to pass, then it somehow deflates the power of it significantly. So I actually was intent, like I'm probably gonna write a book on some big story about this, but I was supposed to write an article that mostly had uh, was about the early Christ Christianity and how early Christians were many, the first Christians were devoted to kind of equality among men and women. And as it were, you know, the, the first shall come last and the last shall come first. There's a kind of radical equality. And I'm still very interested, by the way, in how that was, was um, suppressed. I have a story to tell and it's kind of interesting, but we, you know, no time for that here. But what I, what I wound up writing that paper about is just the incredibly brilliant art of, art arguments that Aristotle, Galen, and some of the early doctors gave for the inferiority of women. Yeah, so tell, it, tell us, tell us. Yeah, so, so one, of the, like, one of the really striking examples, I mean, one of the, the, the defining moments is when, when um, I mean, Aristotle thinks that everything in the world moves towards the good. So every human, every, every species in the world is moving towards a kind of, um, it's almost like a divinely ordained good. So human beings are supposed to be rational animals, of course, that move towards the good. So virtue is, is acting out that, that um, inter interior capacity that all human beings have, men and women. The problem though, is that Aristotle saw women's bodies as being inferior to men. And the body, the, so a, a woman has, if you want to talk about it in, as term, in terms of body and soul, which is not exactly what Aristotle would have, would have agreed to, but so, so women have the same cognitive capacities as men do. It's just unfortunate that their bodies have been, um, are organized for a single purpose, namely to easily um, become pregnated and bear children. So women are in a way complete and healthy only when they're bearing children. And so within the teleological system then, women are contributing to the good, but their primary contribution is to bear children and they cannot, because of their bodies, develop um, their, their cognitive capacities fully. So he says things like, he basically, he actually calls, I think I have a quotation or two here. He actually calls women deformed. He says, um, for example, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior. The male is the ruler and the female the subject. So you could sort of say, well, you know, isn't it striking that um, Aristotle says this? Isn't it striking that when I was when I was taught Aristotle in graduate school, I didn't learn that he had said that. So that's important. But then those of us who know something about the history of education or the history of the university, of course, when universities you know, were first created, Aristotle formed the pedagogical structure. So Aristotle, Galen, there's a couple of other medical doctors, all of whom were devoted to this idea of female, that the female bodies were inferior. And that's what every single person who went to the university in medieval and early modern Europe um, learned. And the other slide that I think we won't be able to show, but in this paper of mine, I show frontispieces from um, the beginning of publication, 16th, 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th century, where Aristotle is used as a source of insight in um, universities. In fact, Victorian doctors 
um, Helen in England were, you know, quite happy to talk about the insights of Aristotle and, uh, and actually midwives were often trained in a kind of Aristotelian science. So when we ask ourselves the question, why are women facing the challenges they are, or for that matter, matter non-white privileged men, it's often because there's a kind of medical tradition of explaining how bodies are, are, um, are hierarchical, some lesser than others. And that's, that's all to the point of the good because it's part of a kind of preordained virtuous universe. That's great. And I think it touches on, Helen, I want to go to your book now, um, in part because this, this question of, of, of so, so in the book, let me just frame this for everyone. In the book, um, you, you highlight, uh, you, you tell the history of feminism through 11 fights, so it includes divorce, starting with your own, um, the vote, work, education, time, kind of broad concepts. And as, as Christy is talking, it occurs to me that uh, at least four, if not five of them, relate to women's bodies. So there's sex, play, safety, love, um, and abortion. And you take us through um, the kind of more recent history of these of these concepts. Um, mm. Maybe you could speak to um, just what, one one of one of your chapters that involves women bodies, and 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 maybe how that resonates with what Christy is saying. And then the other thing. Um, that I'd like to add on to that question is your answer in the interest of time, your answer in the conclusion um, to kind of the culmination of all these fights is that we must reinvest um, in structures. And so a one way to um, protect women and protect uh, vulnerable, vulnerable people from these kind of uh, insidious strains of intellectual thought that Kostia is outlying is through through structures and you you write that this is your answer structures 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 social progress is fast captivating enthralling it ferocious it's ferociously beautiful to see the world change um, at the speed of speaking out but those advances won't survive unless we do the hard work of economic and legal reform to support them so um, if you could talk about uh, women's bodies in your book difficult women and tell us why structures are an important counterpoint to uh, ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, I was writing that in the wake, really, of um, the Me Too movement, which was, in, you know, extraordinary um, flowering of activism. And I think you could say the same thing about Black Lives Matter and the wave of protests after the merger of George Floyd, is that there was a kind of sense of a huge emotional release, that these were topics that have been for too long not spoken about and needed this level of attention on them. But whether or not our society was equipped to do the next level. Once we've raised our consciousness you know, in the old 70s term of, 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 of saying that these are important political issues that need to be addressed, okay, then then how? And I think it's, you know, it's very hard if you're in America and you're in a fire at will job, you know, what happens if you get fired because you're pregnant? What legal redress actually do you have? But you have, maybe, you maybe even have technically have the right to sue, but do you have the means to sue? And I was writing about in the context of England, where, um, you know, there was a legal, for a while, legal aid was withdrawn from, from employment claims. So you couldn't get a solicitor to represent you. So you've just been sacked from your job. And now you can't, you, so you don't have any money. And now you can't enforce your legal rights because you can't afford to do that. And so that's the thing I'm talking about. You know, the, 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 the kind of rejoinder to me too was that this is a lot of kind of rich actresses complaining. And while I felt that some of that was quite unfair and unhelpful, there was also a point, which is that rights are absolutely nothing without the ability to enforce them. And what are the structures that allow us to do that? Um, and the other thing I think is really important to say in this context is, I was reading this piece by a philosopher, Kathleen Stock, this morning, arguing with radical feminism about the idea, of, which is about the idea of abolishing gender, saying that that is an impossible project. Ultimately, it can be ameliorated, it can be made to work in different ways, but when men and women do have different bodies, because they will, they will just have different career trajectories, for example. And what has happened too often, I think, is that the advances women have made in the workplace have been around the fact that they've been able to pursue a more male model. They've been able in their 20s to work like men. And that's, you know, that's been something that has caused great advances or the fact that the pill has allowed women control of their fertility. So they've had more time when they weren't in that constant work of, of child rearing. And that has allowed them to compete, therefore, more fairly with men. But there is only so far down that road that you can possibly go when you do have two biological sexes. Mm -hmm. Helen, I want to just stay with you um, 
uh, we can possibly return to this very incendiary topic, um, but you mentioned George Floyd and you mentioned the Me Too movement. Of course, you published Difficult Women in 2020, just as much as the world went into uh, its first, though, of course, not its last lockdown. Uh, and two major consequences of um, this lockdown in terms of being women being in the home, um, and we all read about this, was a major increase in intimate partner violence and the return to traditional gender divisions of housework and childcare that um, many people thought were kind of uh, products of, of previous generations. And so thinking in particular, I, I just wanna get your opinion on this, thinking in particular about your chapter on time in which you cite uh, a great man, but he is great, Frederick Engels, who noted in 1884 that the uh, modern individual family is founded on or concealed uh, domestic slavery of the wife. How would you update your chapter on time or in fact the whole book for a post-COVID, um, post-George uh, Floyd world? I think that was interesting because that was a moment when all the structures that um, women and families had built around themselves in order to deal with the reality for most people now, which is living in a two earner household. If you've got kids, you cannot support them on one salary unless you are, um, you know, in, in an incredibly high profile job that for that reason, single parents struggle an enormous amount. Right. Most people want two salaries in order to support their kids. So one of the things that then happened in the pandemic is, well, whose salary should we safeguard? You know, who is it who's going to get uh, even stuff as simple as like if you've only got one spare bedroom, who is it that gets that to be their home office versus who's working at the kitchen table? Who's, you know, trying to do meetings in the downstairs hallway cupboard, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was, you know, it was it was quite noticeable that that was skewing towards men and, and not necessarily because anybody was a sexist. But because if you're a dual owner couple, it is much more likely in the UK, at least women are much more likely to be in part time work and part time work pays less well per hour anyway. So you are much more likely as a rational economic decision to safeguard the higher earners salary. Yeah. And there has been some good news. Claudia Golden did some research recently, which showed that the she session, the idea that women were going to be forced out of the workforce completely, actually doesn't seem to have happened because there has been so much churn of jobs that actually women have ended up being able to stay in the, in, in the labour market. Mm. But I think just from talking to my friends with children, I know that not you know, some fathers too, but mothers in particular really, really struggled to do all the childcare and all the work in new circumstances and with any support network like nursery, like childminders, like grandparents suddenly taken away from them. Mm. Um, and I think that there are women who feel that their careers and their lifetime earning potential has taken a real knock from the pandemic. Mm. And, you know, I think lockdowns were necessary and they had to be done. But actually, once again, there was an assumption. I have this, you know, through history, women are sort of regarded as sponges and they will just soak up think, whatever needs to be done. Mm. And I think that once again, it spoke to the fact that we, because we can't put a number on work in the home because it doesn't have a contribution to GDP because it isn't quantifiable through wages or salary. Mm. It means that we sort of, it doesn't count in some way, which speaks to a bigger project, I think, of trying to make visible the work that women do in the same way we're trying to make women themselves visible. Mm -hmm. Christy, I want to go to you um, to ask a similar question in the sense that thinking about just the current day and you've argued um, in the academy in this in this address that I mentioned the 2020 address but also in um, the Washington Post that for you um, some of the, the philosophy and, and, and literature that you teach comes most alive in, uh, in detention centers. So you are the creator of Just Ideas, which brings philosophical ideas and literature to the Metropolitan Detention Center, which is a maximum security federal prison in Brooklyn. And I think this helps to further destabilize and decenter who we think about and who we talk about when we think about this, um, you know, Descartes thinking I. Um, and so in this, in this essay, in this op-ed you write, my incarcerated students differ radically from the ones at Columbia. When I walk into a tidy, well-equipped uh, classroom on Morningside campus, I know my undergrads have spent years preparing for academic achievement, supported by families and teachers. When a correctional officer escorts me into a prison room equipped with rickety tables, tangled Venetian blinds and no chalk, I know my incarcerated students have been locked away for years sometimes for decades, with virtually no opportunity for intellectual stimulation. Can you describe, Christia, your experience of teaching 
um, in the Metropolitan Detention Center and how your discussions there have invigorated uh, philosophy and its relation to today's most pressing concerns? Mm -hmm. No, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I in fact, picking up on something that Alice just said, I'm, I'm quite um, moved by the fact that if we, many of the assumptions we have about who can do philosophy or who is clever and smart, or even, you know, Alice, I might push back a little bit about the importance of bodies. I think that you know, there's a way, I mean, since I think a lot of, um, a lot of people who work on gender deviance, for example, would say that you know, bodies are in a continuum. And so, and similarly, I think there's a continuum of, you know, kind of what, what, what counts as education. So in this program I run, the Metropolitan Detention Center, I, I, um, there's, you know, senior professors of philosophy, literature, whatever go in. We always have, a, a, there's, a, everyone's a, a coupled with an assistant. We do theater of the oppressed exercises. So we're like standing on chairs and tables sometimes, you know, doing these crazy exercises to kind of break down barriers. And so, because, you know, you can imagine someone who's been in maximum security prison for very long has been trained to keep their head down and to kind of just try to control themselves as much as possible. So to open people up to kind of have like, you know, thoughts about great ideas or great ideas um, takes a certain amount of work, but we, we do that work. And one of the things that's just striking to me in this teaching is how utterly brilliant and insightful these people can be. And these, you know, so people who've been on often, especially at the Metropolitan Detention Center, this is the, the one of the har harshest prisons in the harshest prison system in the States, which is itself, um, uh, um, you know, very bad on incarceral matters. And here are people who, often who have been in for years, and but they had lives, they were on the streets, they kind of were thinking through things. Um, and you know, thinking through how to how to make a life um, out, outside their home, really, and so they're in, they they're capable of being incredibly um, insightful. And really, one of the things, unlike Columbia students, and so one of the reasons I wanted to make this point about Columbia students, Columbia students can be utterly brilliant, and they're very very good students, but they're kind of trying to look to see what the professor might want them to do. So for example, I don't know, think of Antigone. We mostly teach ancient literature in MDC because it's really hard and students have to kind of get outside themselves. It's not familiar, but just think about an, um, um, and um, let's, or actually uh, we're doing the Oresteia, Aeschylus's Oresteia, which is a really, really difficult play, ancient play, uh, written a hundred years even before Antigone. And there's like this moment when um, Arrest Apollo comes back and tells Orestes to kill his mother, um, a Clytemestra. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Clytemestra. Yeah, thank you. And um, and my students were like, so basically Apollo is just like a hitman. I mean, you know, like getting getting uh, Orestes to be his hitman. And it was like exactly right. Kind of, you know, was it such an insightful way of thinking about power in the play? And so what I what we all do when we teach in this program, all of these um, fancy professors from Columbia and NYU, is we're invariably kind of learning things about texts that we've taught forever, whether it's Plato or Aristotle for that matter, or Antigone or the Oresteia, and you know seeing them in ways that we hadn't been able to see before because these people have this lived experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the morals to the story is just that. I think philosophy and profound, difficult literature is available to anyone, um, whatever their educational background, as long as they're willing to kind of read and think and have the opportunity to do so. Mm. Yeah, Helen, I want to go to you, um, and and then we have a, we have a question in the chat from Johanna. If there are any other questions in the chat, we haven't gotten any others, so um, I, I want to ask Johanna's question before we finish. Um, first, going back to you, Helen, because. Uh, in 2018 and 19, you were the Women in Humanities Honorary Writing Fellow at Oxford University. Um, and in your acknowledgement, you acknowledge your students and your colleagues from that time at the end of your book. Um, do you feel that journalism and your role, you know, at the Atlantic some way brid somehow bridges the gap uh, or between your time um, at Oxford yeah. and kind of like the world? And what is the role of journalism um, in, in this in this bridge, this gap? 
Um, I think for me, that was an opportunity to spend a lot of time in the libraries and the resources of Oxford, which are still kind of um, astonishing to me, even you know, 20 years after I was a student there. And I think there is, it's, it's interesting. One of the things I felt about the book is I needed to be very um, okay with writing things that seemed very basic level. I wonder how Christy feels about this. I think it can be hard sometimes when you're completely immersed in a subject or you've studied it for a long time where you think, well, everyone knows that. That's very boring. But of yeah, course, exactly. <laughs> you know, like you'll see this with your students. Presumably every year a new bunch of 18 year olds turns up and this is all new to them. Like this is very exciting. They, you know, they're not jaded, which is one of the wonderful things about um, about academic life. But I think the same thing can happen in journalism where you assume that everybody, well, everybody knows this discussion has been happening for ages. You know, we've been talking about women being written out of history but, but, like, but also yeah and, and we've been talking about women being written out of history for 50 years now you know surely that's a that's an obvious concept but of course it's it's really not and I think it's one of the things that um you also have to try and remember you're writing for a mass audience rather than for people exactly like you um and I think that's something that is is in both academia and journalism there is a very big difference between a kind of inside baseball article and something that is attempting to kind of reach out and make things much more accessible to people. And so I really I tried hard in writing Difficult Women to say there is no, you know, here's the welcome mat. There is no test for admission here. If you know absolutely nothing about feminism, you are just as welcome as somebody who is, you know, very well, well read in it. And I was surprised how I think that so many I always talk about this in journalism, the problem of it being like coming into a sort of, you know, soap opera 3000 episodes in and thinking, why is everyone arguing with each other? What, like, what's going on here? And, and it'd been quite hard sometimes to find out the origin stories. I think what you were, Chris, you were saying about like, why these, why these myths took hold for so long? How did this idea that everybody held for 1500 years, when did it start and what killed it? You know, I, sometimes that, that very basic stuff is almost the most interesting stuff because people feel that it would be arrogant to try and tackle those incredibly big questions or that, or of course, everyone knows the answer to them. Um, but they're often the most interesting. Right. Christina, and, go ahead. I, 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 I want to jump on what Alice said. I mean, I think that so many professors, you know, scholarly types, nerdy types, um, what the way I describe it is that they like they're writing on epicycles of epicycles, you know, and one of my one of my professors went back in graduate school said, and maybe I took this too much to heart, but like try don't write anything that someone's not going to read in 10 years. And so like, because you know, don't be just part of a conversation of the here and now because that can be kind of boring and just like it naval great gazing. So one of the striking and important ways in which we can learn it from you journalist is that you kind of like need to be part of a conversation, right? You need to kind of be thinking about how this might influence people and write in ways that might appeal to more than the 10 people you know, or 15 who are interested in exactly that point. So there's, it's wonderful to have exactly these kind of conversations and encourage, I think, um, uh, scholarly types to talk to journalists and journalists to talk to you know, nerdy historians. Um, I, just to finish, if you want, I'll answer. I just read um, Joanna's question about Hannah Arendt and, um, and, and, and there is a very similar conversation happens about Margaret Thatcher as a British prime minister and the idea that she was the first female prime minister, but she only had one woman in her cabinet the entire more than a decade that she was in power. And that was her personal friend who was in the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. And I think there are interesting things going on. There. Some people simply aren't interested in their identity as a woman. They actually want to be thought of as sexless. And I think that is particularly acute. You see in the first generation women who break through, they don't want to be put into a little, they don't want to be the female philosopher. They want to be a philosopher who happens to be female. They don't want to be the first female prime minister. They want to be a prime minister who happens to be female. And I think you definitely see that particularly with pioneers because they feel that in some way they'll be put on to kind of play from the ladies tea if they acknowledge that, that they're women. And it can be easier for generations who come after them. And, you know, from talking to friends who are right, both women and racial minorities, there's also a real fear that you will be somehow boxed into writing about subjects in a particular way, or you will, all your subjects will begin, you know, as a woman, I, that kind of form of journalism, which many people find quite reductive, because we often bring loads of different identities and life experiences to any particular piece, and just picking one of them can feel like sort of claiming a sort of strange kind of moral authority that's also quite diminishing at the same time. Mm. So yeah, I would I, I would love to have seen somebody with the brain like Hannah Arendt write about more about feminism. Um, but I also can see why 
either it particularly didn't interest her or she wanted to be taken seriously, which at the time meant being taken as seriously as a man. And, and I'm gonna it's read all of our job to, to break that cycle. I'm going to read the question just for posterity and then Christia, let's get your answer so, so that people watching will, will um, retrospectively have the question then we'll go to Christia. So Johanna asks or says that it's disappointing that women who were able to be philosophers did nothing to advance the representation, representation of women in philosophy. I'm thinking of someone like Hannah Arendt, a great thinker herself, but very silent when it came to women's advancement in society. What can we do to ensure that women are more fairly representative as part of an acting thinking actively thinking community, uh, how do we ensure women's voices are heard and even celebrated? Christia, let's go to you. And then I'm looking at the time. Unfortunately, we have so much more to say, but we'll have to end there. OK, um, one of, I mean, I, I guess the project that Melvin and I are interested in this um, Oxford New Histories Philosophy and also my Just Ideas program is really exactly concerned with bringing philosophy to um, people and making it clear that there can be many, many different kinds of voices in philosophy. So picking up on Alice is really important point. Like for example, I'm the first person in my family to go to university. I grew up, you know, I'm a hip from Texas, right? And so one of the reasons I think I have a kind of a chutzpah, as we say on the Upper West Side, <laughs> and can, can be that way in, in philosophy is because I kind of I don't know better. So when I was in graduate school, I just asked random questions that were not kind of like kosher, again, <laughs> to use that, these words. And so we want people of color. We want um, working class folks. We want people who are thinking often are not, um, not have not in what, in um, imbibed all of the kind of forms of privilege mm -hmm. that the academia and scholarship sometimes requires. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what I think, the Hannah, you know, I, I don't want to talk about Hannah Arendt. I, I think it's always not a good idea to ask, like, why didn't someone do something? But what I'm interested in doing, and a lot of us are interested in doing now, is to um, encourage voices, people whose voices have not been often heard in the history of philosophy, uh, or rather, in, sorry, in philosophy, to come forward, see themselves as philosophers. So my you know, my, some of my best friends now are people who are incarcerated for 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. They're out, they're activists, they talk about philosophy, they share philosophy, they're using it in their lives in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not gonna become philosophers, maybe thank God, <laughs> you know, professional philosophers, but they surely are, you know, again, have imbibed these lessons. So I, I think philosophy has a kind of power that we need to share more of. And the best way of doing that is to include different voices, raise the kinds of questions we're raising here today um, mm -hmm. and let people know that it's not just for the white dudes um, with the long robes. Okay, I have, I, I have one more question for you, Helen, um, because it's, uh, it's something I'm just thinking about um, and it really gets this point of imbibing. And since you're kind of more in the world of, of words than Christia is just by nature of your job, um, how do you not imbibe the language of the internet? I'm so struck by 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 Twitter and Instagram and the and the reposting and the sharing and the liking and and all of the kind of reproduction around language that goes on on the internet. Um, and people are either saying the same thing or they're saying nothing. <laughs> well, how, you, how um, do you tackle that? <laughs> Well, I know I, I suspended my Twitter account for the duration of book. I know, and that's why I wanted that, to ask you about that. I so I'm now that. having very big, long thoughts, sometimes for five or ten seconds at a <laughs> time before being derailed. <laughs> it's extraordinary. But I um I read a lot of different. I read a lot of magazines and Substacks actually because I find that news journalism, having done it myself, you have to just you know hear a thing has happened, have a thought. A thing has happened, have a thought, and that does tend to lead to just it's this it's the top. You know, they're very, they're very much the foam on the top of your brain. You're not kind of getting down into the stuff underneath. Um, and I think that's kind of, I think it goes to Chrissy's point about trying to ask yourself what will be still interesting in 10 years time. Right, Always ask it. yourself, <laughs> is this, if I had to explain this to someone and to myself in the future, I'm like, is this just dr drama or is this actually something that's, uh, that's interesting? Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish we had like another whole more hour, but, um, and we're already way over. So anyway, thank you so much.